Well, welcome to the luncheon seminar on assuring sustainable access to antibiotics, moving from delinkage to an end-to-end -end approach. This um, seminar for the lunchtime, if I could have everyone's attention. <laughs> I know there'll be continuing people to probably to get lunch and we'll be coming in um, for the next few minutes, but I thought we'd get started given how limited the time is over the luncheon seminar. Um, so again, welcome to this luncheon seminar on ensuring sustainable access to antibiotics, moving from delinkage to an end-to-end -end approach, supported by REACT Action on Antibiotic Resistance. We appreciate the opportunity that the conference organizers have provided us to discuss how the landscape of antibiotic innovation or the challenges of ensuring access and stewardship present unique challenges to the traditional model of IP-driven pharmaceutical innovation. I'm Anthony So, Director of the IDEA Initiative and the, uh, and the uh, professor of the practice from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and director of the Strategic Policy Pro Program of REACT, Action on Antibiotic Resistance, a global network dedicated to meeting the challenge of antibiotic resistance. And we're delighted today to have a wonderful panel to share perspectives on this issue today. Let me just introduce them um, in succession first, and then we'll get a kickoff um, with my presentation offering some framing remarks. Uh, first, we'll have after me, Viviana, Dr. Viviana Munoz Tellez is the coordinator of the Development in Innovation and Intellectual Property um, Program at the Sal Center. She holds a doctorate degree in the management technology from the Ecole Polytechnique de Lausanne in Switzerland, and a master's degree from the Development Management Program at the London School of Economics. Her research areas include the economics of biomedical innovation, intellectual property, Property, public health, and development policy. Prior, previous to joining the Sal Center in 2006, she conducted research at the Queen Mary Research Institute at the University of London on non-governmental public action on intellectual property governance. And Viviana will be discuss what LMIC seek in an innovation system producing novel antibiotics, what hopes we should pin on the draft global framework on development stewardship to combat AMR, and how global coordination of R&D might help. After her, we have Michelle Childs. Michelle Childs is head of policy advocacy at the Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative and Guard P. She is currently based in Brazil. She brings considerable experience, I'm sure she's known to many of you here, in proposing and advocating for solutions to access and innovation barriers faced by developing countries and health providers. She has helped to develop several proposals on innovation using open knowledge principles for Chagas disease, TB, and was a co-author of the original proposal for the creation of a patent pool for the HIV medicines by Unitaid. And our final speaker will be Brenda Waning, who serves as the chief of the global drug facility at the Stop TB Partnership in Geneva. She's been working on access to medicines issues for over 20 years. While an academic at Boston University, she taught, advised governments and donors, and published widely on the use of pharmaceutical policies and market interventions to promote access. And she spent also five years leading the strategy investment and market shaping work at Unitaid. And we'll, we're delighted to have her here to speak, particularly on the implications of the global drug facility for TB, as well as, of course, its potential implications for antibiotic, um, as well as we actually continue, of course, to extend um, these kinds of efforts for stewardship for antibiotics globally. Let me begin by offering some framing remarks and then, of course, turn to our panelists. At the outset, too, let me say that this presentation represents my own personal views, not those of the UN Interagency Coordination Group on AMR or the World Health Organization with which I have affiliation. And that there is my WHO Ethics Council, of course, disclosure um, and disclaimer. Much of this policy landscape has focused on recent years on what might be really described as innovative financing, variations of push and pull. And we'd like to deepen the discussion, really, in today's seminar. So push incentives, of course, pay for the inputs of R&D, decreasing the red zone, and thereby de-risking the pipeline. Push incentives can, of course, take various forms, such as grants, tax credits, or publicly funded support from product development partnerships in the R&D process. And so you can see, of course, here, this illustrates, of course, on, on the one side. Of course, on the other side, there is the pool incentives. And the pool incentives pay for the outputs of R&D and ensure returns on investment. Pool mechanisms, of course, can take various forms as well, from IP incentives to prizes and advanced market commitments. Now, of course, in this space, of the concept of deal linkage has arisen as a key principle in policy discussions over antibiotic innovation. Much of the global health community used deal linkage in the way that the WHO's consultative expert working group defined it a few years back. Delinking is a means of divorcing the funding of R&D from product pricing. When the consultative expert working group described the idea, they envisioned that generic competition would bring pricing closer to marginal cost. 
More recently, D-linkage has been discussed in circles involved in the innovation of antibiotics. Here, D-linkage seeks to divorce the return on investment from the sales volume of reimbursement, or in other words, price times quantity. And in tackling antibiotic resistance, quantity matters. For antibiotics, the greater use of antibacterial drugs results in greater resistance. Now, putting these concepts together, we can see how the Boston Consulting Group apply these approaches in their work for the German Federal Ministry of Health. In their report, Breaking Through the Wall, a call for concerted action on antibiotics research and development, you can see actually that they've used a number of different approaches. And I'll just simply point them out that the report called for three funding vehicles positioned at different points in the pharmaceutical value chain. A, a global research fund upstream in the R&D pipeline, push. B, a global development fund to support clinical trial te testing, also push. And to see a global launch reward that will help ensure returns on an investment pool. In composite, their recommendations give shape to a proposed policy initiative, a global union for antibiotics research and development, or GARD, which sounds strikingly similar to GARD P. They also took a page from the same hymn book as the product of in partnerships like DND and GARD P and called for target product profiles which they described as, quote, a proprietary planning tool used in industry to guide product development and to inform regulatory body and investors, unquote. Now, of course, target product profiles have also been used in the public sector to shape the specifications of products, such as pneumococcal vaccine. And, this, and in the hands of, of course, product development part partnerships like DNDI, affordability of the end product is often one specification. BCG, however, separated this out from their use of target product profiles and by so doing, they opened the door to what they called differentiated pricing and access requirements for new drugs in all funding contracts entered into with GARD. Now, this differentiated pricing approach allowed for a partial delinkage approach, where the return on investment is divorced from the price and quantity of drugs sold, but only in certain markets, such as LMIC or low middle income country markets. In industrialized country markets, the delinkage requirement would not necessarily apply. And this obviously raises important questions of double standards. Why should we be more concerned about stewardship just in LMIC markets when we do such a not so great job, actually, in, of course, handling overuse in countries even like the United States? Now, an important part of the rationale for delinkage is to ensure access and stewardship. But by whom? As we described, actually, as we have described in the mechanism so far, the linkage focuses on changing the economic incentives of the drug company by divorcing the costs of investment in R&D from price and volume of sales. Now, drug companies can help ensure affordable prices, deliver secure and stable supplies of antibiotics, provide drug formulation and packaging best suited for medication adherence, and yes, refrain from actually mispromoting these drugs. But do we want drug companies involved in stewardship in the doctor-patient encounter? And if so, under what circumstances? The FDA, for example, can require for some cancer drugs that drug companies monitor and be accountable for the marketed use of a drug. And this has taken, of course, the form of the Risk and Evaluation Mitigation Strategy, or REMS. That, and this might involve a number of core strategies, limiting the prescription to trained providers or dispensing to certified institutions, administering the drug, in specific healthcare settings, or requiring the use based on clinical algorithms or diagnostic test findings. And there are various proposals in the past, from the Health Impact Fund to the Strategic Antibiotic Reserve, that apply just such an approach. In exchange for some reimbursement incentive, companies take responsibility for stewardship. In exchange for keeping resistance rates down, these approaches would guarantee higher reimbursement rates. But drug companies don't want this responsibility, nor are they well positioned to carry them out, given how widely used antibiotic treatments are in the healthcare system. And honestly, few in public health believe that vesting greater control of the drug industry over the practice of medicine would necessarily be a good thing. Now, delinkage might be important for ensuring antimicrobial stewardship, but it is not likely to be sufficient. In REACT, with Guard P and elsewhere, we have begun to consider a broader concept of sustainable access. But what do we mean by sustainable access? At root, we expect that sustainable access implies availability of the drug. For an antibiotic, that would mean we value its continued effectiveness as part of sustainable access. 
Affordability also figures into sustainable access. And of course, access but not excess as well. And might there be also other dimensions? And I put that question forward, and I'm sure we can have some useful discussion over that. We have begun to imagine what might complement delinkage in what we in GARD-P have begun to call an end-to-end -end approach. And if you look at the entire value chain from target product profile to equitable access and scale up, at every stage of the process from bench to bedside, we might ask, how might our overarching goal of sustainable access be better served? Does the target product profile ensure affordability of the end product? Is the process of innovation of a new drug not just for, for those in disease endemic countries, but also by those in disease endemic countries? How sustainable is the production of, the, of a new drug? And is there an enabling regulatory environment? Are the data from clinical testing of the drug publicly shared and the invention and platforms non-exclusively licensed? Is the financing delinked? And in scaling up the use of the drug, is the pricing fair and affordable? Now, some elements will matter more than others, make more of a difference in ensuring sustainable access. For example, ensuring the availability of innovation platforms for drug discovery, prolonging the life cycle of an antibiotic by ensuring sustainable production and repurposing older antibiotics, or using, perhaps, innovative financing approaches to ensure affordability, as some of my colleagues on this panel will shortly describe through the examples of DNDI Guard P and the Global Drug Facility, or supporting diagnostic platforms that might ensure access but not excess of antibiotics. Through an end-to-end -end approach, we are beginning to envision how making an intervention in one part of the supply chain might have equity impact on another part of the supply chain, and we hope that we are taking a more systems approach to doing so, moving beyond whereby a system whereby we make only drug by drug, bet by bet, actually sort of investments company by company to a more systems approach. So before turning to my colleagues, let me flag two more other, two other approaches that are worth discussing, both with potential to delink investments in the R&D costs from the price and quantity of drugs sold, and also perhaps to advance how antimicrobial stewardship might be handled. The medicines patent pool in a submission to the UN Interagency Coordination Group on AMR suggests that licensing might be linked to requirements to ensure access and stewardship, and that it could build in potential licensing provisions, conditioning whether marketing and promotion is done to manage, for example, the release of active pharmaceutical ingredients into the environment. And I believe they are here, I believe Esteban is here, um, and perhaps in the Q&A session they might elaborate further. Also of interest, F FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb has floated a proposal for ensuring more consistent and predictable returns to the manufacturer of antibiotics. He suggests that acute care institutions would pay a fixed licensing fee for access to the drug. In exchange, the institution would receive the right to use a number of annual doses. The FDA argues that the, this puts its institutions fully in charge of stewardship of these medicines. And it would be interesting to hear from around the table here what all of you think about such a licensing arrangement to ensure guaranteed returns to the pharmaceutical manufacturer. Finally, some years ago, we suggested that we might re-engineer the R&D value chain if we paid more attention to how we shared resources, shared risks, and shared rewards. Sharing resources refers to efforts to ensure the availability of research inputs. Sharing risks speaks to the need for leveraging public resources in ways that lower the barrier for firms, academic research, research institutions, and others to contribute to the innovation of novel antibiotics. And sharing rewards addresses the need not only for a sustainable business model for bringing these drugs to market, but importantly, fair returns on this public investment, perhaps through delinking R&D investment from sales of the product. But I'll close with one fascinating development Recently, major hospital systems led by Intermountain Healthcare launched Civica Rx, a nonprofit generic company. And this changes the dynamics in the value chain, now with the prospect of the healthcare delivery system reaching and vertically integrating into actually the pharmaceutical R&D system. And I suspect the years ahead, we will actually see many more exciting developments for us to discuss. So I hope this introduction helps to frame the talks of our panelists to come. And our first speaker will be Viviana Munoz, who will share with us, of course, some of what actually those in low and middle income countries might hope and expect of such a system. Thank you so much.
thank you, Anthony, for having invited me to be part of this great panel with the very good speakers. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, what I will be talking to you about, and I kept the title that Anthony suggested for me, is giving a southern perspective on innovation and access issues with regards to antibiotics. Um, so my experience is working with developing countries. Uh, so South Center is an intergovernmental organization. Uh, we have 54 members uh, from different regions around the world, and we work overall with a group of 77 in China. So our role is really to think about um, these issues, considering in particular the interests of, of our members. Um, but I'd like to say at the outset that my views here are personal, and they don't in any way reflect those of the South Center as the group of countries or any particular members. So the first thing I'd like to highlight um, when thinking about what's happening in the world of antibiotic innovation and access is really to think that in the context of low and middle income countries, um, there's a number of challenges that are related. And it's very hard to discuss separately issues of innovation in antibiotics if we don't also consider what's the broader challenges um, related to the whole um, innovation system, um, not only for antibiotics, but in generally of the health systems of these countries. Um, so, to start with, in terms of challenges, um, a core burden that developing countries have is not only with regards to um, uh, the issue now, which is gaining more, perhaps, global attention in terms of resistance to antibiotics, um, but the access core issues continue to be extremely substantial. Um, so when we're trying to tackle now this increasing global challenge, which of course is also essential to be tackled within national domestic efforts by developing countries, we also need to understand that for developing countries, their responses need to integrate a core response also to the access issue. So this is not a new challenge, but it is um, critical in the area of antibiotics as it is for other medicines. So we, we have many cases of this, for, for example, um, uh, children, uh, UNICEF as, as a core player in, in this area continues to say, let's give more attention to the number of children that continue to die by untreatable pneumonia, when we could have more effective vaccines being delivered here, as well as just basic treatment with antibiotics. How is it possible that even with low prices, we're still unable to treat the number of children that are dying from treatable diseases, such as pneumonia? Tuberculosis, we had yesterday the high-level panel um, at, the, at the UNGA, and you might have all heard what is the latest data as well coming from the World Health Organization. Um, so this continues to be preventable and curable, and we still have highly toxic medicines, um, and so those where we have had new innovations um, continue to be extremely high cost. Um, so this is a, a recurring issue of access, and we just don't want to leave the issue of access behind when we're still trying to find um, adequate solutions for the issues of um, continued uh, growing resistance, as well as the need for stewardship. Um, in addition, uh, it's very important, um, as, as Anthony was mentioning, that we also take a systems approach in looking overall, not only of one part of the solutions, but really at how these um, different areas interact. So um, the basic issues of the health systems, their structure and their capacities is essential to understand what kind of adequate responses can be crafted at the national level. So there will be very little effectiveness of having some new um, global rules um, that will not be able to be implemented effectively domestically. So really understanding what are those core basic challenges um, from the health system strengthening approach, there is much that can be achieved here. For example, with the basic um, increase in capacity at prevention um, and control, uh, for example, for adequate access to vaccines so that then we don't have to make um, increasing use antibiotics. Um, and in terms of the innovations, uh, I'll, come more, um, I'll come more in a minute, but generally to say that this integration of, of the different um, types of interventions is quite critical from the perspective of developing countries. Now, I think uh, Anthony has already given us a, a quite good run through of what are some of the systemic problems with the innovation system for new antibiotics overall. Um, I'll just focus then in adding some elements from the perspective of, of low and middle income countries. So while declining investment in new antibiotics has been happening around, I'd like to highlight that in some developing countries, there's increasing capacity for research. And for example, um, some of you might not know that BRICS countries right now in 
at least for the data for 2017, they were the highest domestic investors for tuberculosis research. So there is increasing um, uh, capacities that we also need to harness in the area of innovation coming from developing countries, not only to see them as well, you know, will there be additional financing to some global mechanisms, but also understand the dynamics of how can their national research capacities also be integrated um, in these uh, global responses. Um, in addition to the problem of, of having new antibiotics, uh, there's also the issue of recurring shortages of old antibiotics that might also be off patent. Um, so this is also an, uh, an integrated response, but also need to um, uh, deal with the issue of, of recurring shortages. Now, um, as, as we might all know, um, there is clear market failures in the area of innovation um, for antibiotics. Um, we could analyze them in different ways. Um, perhaps most of you are already familiar with the obvious market failures, um, whereby private sector has been saying recurrently, um, we are exiting the sector because it's simply not profitable enough. Um, if we come up with new antibiotics that are costly, soon they will be replicated and we're competing against all type of antibiotics. Um, so those are some concerns with incentives. At the same time, um, I think the point uh, that already Anthony was also highlighting is that we have to think of incentives beyond the traditional approach of only having private sector traditional players coming in, um, but also think about what other systemic interactions we can have um, and thinking more about the whole um, R&D chain. In this sense, um, some of the incentives that um, need to be considered as well is how to ensure that if we are having public sector financing increasing as a means to build these new incentive models, then how do we ensure that we're really investing in areas that really um, provide more public health benefit? Um, so the issue of target product profiles, of course, will be, um, focus, will be discussed further in detail. Um, but at the same time, the way we're crafting these early incentives um, should also be considering what might be those negative impacts that we may have, even where there is increased investment. And this is the area where intellectual property um, perhaps uh, also plays um, uh, a role. While for some particular forms um, and for some markets, uh, intellectual property might act as an incentive for some private sector financing or as some of these measures related to IP, for example, transfer of vouchers and so forth are coming forth as ideas, um, you might think, yes, private sector might be inclined to think that this could be useful. Um, however, if we do have these types of incentives, on the one hand, we are affecting the key issue of access. So this is one area where we see clearly from the few, very few antibiotics that we have had, so for example, with Blacodim and, and Delaminid, um, that it is intellectual property that is acting as an, as an obstacle to access. Even though we have now uh, pool procurement mechanisms for these, even some specific um, voluntary measures being used, prices are way beyond what the national governments of the most burdened um, countries with tuberculosis for highly drug resistant forms um, can actually pay. So when you talk about coming down to a low price of five four hundred dollars, this is not a low price when you're in a very um, poverty-ridden context and with governments that are trying to provide universal health coverage for everyone. Um, so we're it, it's clearly an issue where we have clear examples um, that intellectual property is affecting access, um, despite the fact that we have had you know these very few um, innovations, at least in the area of tuberculosis. Not to talk about other areas where we have the priority pathogens list and we see that there's just completely a lack of new innovation on other priority areas for, for bacterial infections. Um, so the point here is to say simply that uh, we need to link the incentives together with also access and rational use um, so we can't see them um, separately. And um, to mention also uh, that there has been uh, extensive work coming from WHO context and now in the UN, about how can you actually make this linkage between innovation and access. Um, and this is the principles that have been established for affordability, effectiveness, efficiency, and equity, um, as well as the um, overall uh, 
principles that uh, research and development efforts, and this would mean you know, whether they're private sector, whether they've been financed by public sector money as well, should be based on real needs. So where are the priority targets, as well as the relevant evidence? And as a shared responsibility, um, this is, means the government should also have some commitment into providing the resources for the necessary um, delinkage. Um, delinkage has already been mentioned generally, and, and of course the, 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 the point is that with antibiotics, you're delinking not only um, from the price, but also from the volume, um, because you want to make sure that you're not creating any, um, any, any incentives where you might actually be increasing use of antibiotics in a way that is um, not sustainable. Now, in terms of where um, the discussions have been of what can be done um, for improving coordination, um, so for, for developing countries, a core concern is, on the one hand, that their priorities um, for investments are included. And you see this more at the level of international donor financing than, than actually at national-based financing. So some of the major donors that remain um, from Western countries are not necessarily targeting the priority uh, pathogens that perhaps would be the focus of interest for some um, domestic um, constituencies or for some developing countries. Um, so in terms of thinking of global priorities, the idea would be to enhance um, that, that uh, understanding that we really need to focus on, on where the, the biggest burdens are, um, including in developing countries. Um, funding efforts tend to be quite um, um, separate, at least for, for the donor agencies and domestic um, national funders. So the idea of having some more global coordination is also to understand what other efforts are being done by others, where are they funding, and try to create more synergies instead of duplication. Um, here also um, intellectual property can be um, a, a problem in terms of uh, the amount of data and information that's being shared, uh, for example, outcomes of clinical trials and so forth. So the R&D coordination also is not only um, for financing, but also in terms of platforms and of, of sharing um, information data to be able to speed up the development process. And um, in terms of where the discussions are now, the, the main mechanism that's being developed is really um, central, uh, centralized through the G20, which is the um, development of an R&D coordination hub. And um, while this is a, it's a good idea, it's very important is to extend this and to have much more integration or participation of low and middle income countries. As you may know, G20 has about seven developing countries um, there, which um, uh, have, have have a, a, a key role to play, but all the rest of the countries are excluded from the system. So if you really want to have a, an R&D coordination hub that's global, you need to incorporate participation much more broadly from developing countries. Um, the other process I'd like to draw quickly attention to is the Global Development and Stewardship Framework, which is being developed, led by WHO, together with FAO and OIE. Um, now, the, the expectation is that the Global Development and Stewardship Framework will pay attention to the issues of access as well as um, innovation um, from the perspective, as I mentioned before, including the principles for R&D as well as taking into account the specific needs of developing countries. Now, where the process is now, I would say um, the consultation is taking place next month. You will see that very few developing countries so far have been actively engaged in this process. So this is one area where I think those of you here, in particular involved in activism, could be really helpful, is um, to try to uh, um, bring this idea to different constituencies that there's a need to be engaged in this process in order to have um, an adequate access uh, framework uh, that's incorporated in here. It's not very clear what this will be. Will it be new regulations? Will it be a compilation of different instruments that already exist? Um, but if we are going to push for new global rules, then we also want to have, for example, more access mechanisms here, as well as the innovation aspect to, to include um, the elements outlined before. And not that we have, for example, just a menu of, of different incentives where developing countries are only invited to finance, uh, but not to be part of, of the actual R&D collaborations that can take place and other of these elements I mentioned before. And um, finally, to mention that with regards to the UN level processes, that's another area where we need more participation and engagement by low and middle income countries. 
Um, of course, this is an expert group that's, um, that's, that's separate from member states, uh, but uh, they've been doing consultation processes. And through those, you also see that there is just a number of developed countries that have been making comments and very, very little or no participation so far in the consultations by low and middle income countries. Um, and one of the reasons for that, partly, it's not, um, it's not perhaps a sense that if there is not a, a real um, interest in, in, taking into, in taking into account those, those points that I've mentioned so far, then there's more of a reluctance to engage if there's a sense that this is only going to be a regulatory framework or recommendations are going to you know, be pushing strong on stewardship, particularly on the animal side, but not providing an, uh, an, um, also some responses in the areas, in particular in access. Um, so I think I will leave that there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Viviana. And Viviana's presentation really, um, I think, layers on another level of complexity to actually our discussions in the healthcare system as it tackles AMR. Um, underuse and overuse, obviously, in areas of higher disease burden and the need to develop and harness, of course, R&D capacity of the LMICs, as well as the continuing challenge of meeting the principles of affordability, effectiveness, efficiency, and equity laid out in the UN political declaration in a global system where LMICs actually may need greater voice in institutional frameworks like the global, like the AMR R&D Coordination Hub. Now, importantly, we, I do want to flag also that there will be an opportunity here at the Global IP Congress that um, the Antibiotic Resistance Coalition has put together for tomorrow morning from 8 to 9.30. For those who will get up early, actually, we'll have breakfast available for it. But I just want to make a plug that actually we will have a teleconsultation with WHO, FAO, and OIE represented. Um, as they actually roll out the draft global frameworks for, for on, uh, on uh, development stewardship for discussion uh, with civil society around the world coming in by teleconference. But, but for those here at the Congress, you can participate in person. And perhaps maybe, Virgin, you can get the logistical details we can put up at the end of the, um, of the, of the seminar. Um, now I'd like to invite, of course, Michelle Childs to actually, of course, take us into perhaps one of the most exciting developments in my mind in the antibiotic innovation space, which, of course, is their, the approach of DNDI and RP um, in their efforts to take into account some of the issues that have been laid out by Viviana and myself and offering, a, hopefully, a start to an end-to-end -end approach. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so what I thought I'd do is, first of all, take you through some of the, the issues um, that need to be addressed when you're talking about R&D for AMR. I mean, some of this you know, Anthony and Viviana have touched on, but I think it's, it's worth um, reiterating that. For us, what we're really looking at is to try and reframe the, de the debate on stimulating antibiotic development, because at the moment, there's a lot of discussion about standalone incentives and it seems to be taken out of the context of what it is we're trying to achieve and how we're trying to achieve it. And um, really what we need to be looking at is an end-to-end -end approach, which goes from basic research to the patient. And we're looking at incentives that need to target support to a broad range of actors in three key areas. Firstly, basic research and discovery. The, the pipelines are pretty empty and we, we need to stimulate new approaches. The optimization of existing drugs, um, as well as the clinical development of new drugs. And importantly, there has to be a focus on public health, not just what is already in the pipeline. Um, and you need to be looking at prioritizing needs on the intersection of not just the pathogens, but the diseases and syndromes and specific populations, for example, children. And so what we'd li really like to see is to, to use some of the uh, the ways that we're approaching this to look at driving the discussions on incentives and, and funding from R&D to really be practical. First of all, look at the landscape, look what actually is being done and who is doing it. And the WHO has done a, a great deal of work here looking at the, the pipeline, it's done a pipeline analysis which shows that there is very little in the pipeline and that which is being taken forward is primarily being driven by biotechs. You need to be looking at addressing priorities and, and tying that funding to public health returns, which includes both access and stewardship, which we then talk about as sustainable access. And importantly, rather than first talk about the type of incentive, whether it's push or pull, start with where in the R&D pipeline is funding needed and what type of actor needs it. That should drive the debate. And then you look at whether the particular incentive 
fits that particular actor. The current debates focus primarily on big market entry rewards prizes for big pharmaceutical companies, and particularly in the, in the US most recently, transferable intellectual property rights, um, without really looking at whether these will deliver on what we need and are focusing on the right actors. And they have, don't talk about uh, provisions for um, access uh, and stewardship. And we need to look at how to optimize and use the existing um, antibiotics, both because practically more people are dying from lack of access than from resistance. But also, as an R&D organization, we really need to learn from how we control existing drugs. Um, it's ridiculous to try and start again if we haven't solved the problems that we're facing already in terms of access and stewardship. But, so the two need to go together. And finally, we think there's a key role for the WHO and, and, and others in this global framework, because what I'll go on to show is that as an R&D organization, we can um, put an element in relation to stewardship and, uh, and access, but this needs to be in the context of health systems and other stakeholders, and it really needs guidance from those other bodies. So talking about uh, GARD-P, GARD-P is the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership. Um, basically, it was set up in response to the Global Action Plan, which called for new pu public and private partnerships to develop uh, new antibiotics. It's focusing on drug-resistant bacterial infections, primarily based on the WHO's priority pathogen list. And the aim is to deliver four improved treatments by uh, 2023. Um, and to ensure that any treatments that are produced um, are accessible to those who need them, but are also sustainably used. It is global in scope. Uh, AMR affects all countries. Um, we've got four programs, um, a memory recovery, which is basically seeking to revive old knowledge um, and to encourage early research. Uh, a program on sexual transmitted infections with an initial focus on gonorrhea. Neonatal sepsis, where we're trying to find new treatments for babies. Um, and pediatric antibiotics, which is trying to look at optimizing existing antibiotics and uh, try to uh, generate new antibiotics for children. It's a joint initiative by the World Health Organization and DNDI, and it really draws its strength from that because the World Health Organization is both driving the, the health approach, but has also done a lot of important work in, in identifying the pathogens and the pipelines. DNDI is a not-for-profit drug development partnership, which has shown that you can take a public health approach to fill pipelines and deliver. And GARD-P is seeking to build on those lessons to see whether they can be applied in AMR, which has uh, some different characteristics. So, how does GARD-P seek to address some of the challenges that we've talked about? Well, one of the challenges in, in R&D is that you re it requires a long-term approach. Uh, you have to have a sustainable funding, but there are, it's also risky. So GARD-P takes a portfolio approach so that, that it's looking at a number of areas to be involved in, but also makes a long-term a commitment to partners and projects, and seeks to have short, medium, and long-term outputs. I think it's important to state that no country can do it alone. It's important that anybody who's working in the R&D space works collaboratively and builds on global partnerships, which, as Viviana talks about, builds on the capacity which is available in all countries. It's also important to note that the AMR landscape is changing. We're seeing, on the, on, on, the, on the one hand, a number of funding institutions coming in, but we're also seeing a number of big pharmaceutical companies exiting the space. Um, I think GARD-P can fill a gap as one of the few entities that supports end-to-end -end public health-driven R&D, but we need others. Um, it's important also when we're talking about funding that funding research is not the same as conducting research and development. It's important that when you're look, looking at applying funding in research and development, that you recognize that it needs to be applied to some of the complex areas of research and development. So when people start to talk about a pipeline coordinator, so that you're taking the early res research and taking it all the way through the clinical process. 
Um, and GARDP is one of the few entities which is working with SME, a small biotech, on late stage development. And that's quite important because if we go back to what the WHO has found in its, in its pipeline analysis, a lot of the novel compounds are going to come from biotechs, but they have real difficulty in taking it through to the final stages. Um, and therefore, GARDP is looking at ways in which you could work with some of the biotechs to take it through to the end stages. And also trying to address this public return on public investment, which is looking at how you can negotiate and ensure obligations on the partners that GARDP works with. And, and this is, I think, something we need to come back and discuss. I mean, if required, GARDP will also seek to manage any intellectual property to reach those goals. And it's one of the things that also the medicines patent pool is, is seeking to look at. Um, I think it's important to, to look at some of where we are in terms of some of the global approaches and, and funders. You can see that all, the good news is, is that although there has been a, a number of approaches for funders, a lot of that funding stops at certain areas. It doesn't go right to the final mile. And so it's important that we look at ways in which that existing funding and existing approaches has terms and conditions that allow it to be taken forward, but also organizations that they can hand over to that take it to the final uh, mile and to the patient. If we look at ch challenges for sustainable access, and this is one of the, the difficult things that, that we're kind of looking at, of how do you turn some of the things that we've been talking about as principles and ideas into practical outcomes when you are negotiating um, with, with partners. There are a number of things that need to be looked at. Um, it's not just the lack of development. It's how will the, uh, any resulting products be distributed. There are often inadequate regulatory strategies or none at all in terms of which countries they're going to register. Um, and there's also uh, a lack of um, experience uh, and agreement on how new chemical entities would be introduced in this area. There are, of course, questions about fair pricing, inappropriate use, quality. So when you're looking at sustainable access as a product developer, you have to find ways of trying to deal with all of those issues. And it's important that we look at building measures up front to ensure that um, we have access and stewardship. And the GARDP approach is kind of building a bit on the DNDI model where it's a virtual organization. So um, GARDP has in-house capacity, but basically works with a number of partners in the, in the sort of second wheel. Um, and it then goes around and intervenes in any area. But I think it's important to note that this is also a circle because I think any of the research studies and trials will also be made publicly available, which then will be able to feed into um, the prioritization of, of other health needs. I wanted to just take through a specific example of how we're trying to bring some of these things together um, and link the, the right actors in the right way. Um, by looking at an uh, approach that we're taking uh, for gonorrhea, um, the WHO and GARDP work together to look at what the R&D roadmap should be to try and tackle multidrug resistant gonorrhea. And therefore, you know, what were the needs, what type of products would need to be created. It also entered into an um, agreement with a, with a small biotech to develop a novel first-in-class oral antibiotic. Um, and this came about at the time that the WHO, and you also will see it here, the CDC, is talking about the rise in antibi antibiotic resistance to gonorrhea. Um, I think it might be just interesting to look at how we've tried to, and this is a very early stage, to try to address some of these issues um, uh, in, in the approach to gonorrhea. Firstly, we've looked at utilizing surveillance data to determine what the actual needs and priorities are. And I think it's an important point because surveillance data is not just to inform what the problem is, but can inform the research and development because we need to be looking at what's actually happening on the ground. One of the ways that we try to um, ensure some kind of stewardship is to limit the development to um, gonorrhea. Uh, 
and for hospital-based infections. So therefore, it will not be used for other areas and therefore will help to preserve the use of that drug. They, we've entered into a license with an Entesis for 168 developing countries. Um, there's also the ability to include further countries who are typically excluded from licensing if they contribute to research and development, which is a kind of interesting way to progress in a small way some of this idea of delinkage because if they do contribute, then they are able to enter into some of the access agreements. Um, it's, well, there's also the ability to sub-license, um, and that includes conditions on quality manufacturing environmental standards. There are affordable clauses for both low and middle income countries and also high income countries. Um, it's a registration strategy to prioritize registration in relevant countries. Um, and we're looking at monitoring use in, on the ground to pilot implementation studies to see how this will work. And we're working with the WHO to facilitate diagnostics and target product profiles to guide the research and development. And I, um, I won't go into detail on this, but the importance of developing a target product profile from a public health point of view is that you look to uh, both the indication, you look at where it's going to be used, and also the price. So you take into account that we need to be looking at um, small doses, heat stabilization, um, because it will be used in multiple environments. So GARD-P offers one vehicle for countries to support public interest R&D. But I wanted to point out, this isn't just a funding request, but we've secured uh, 650 million euros. There's another 200 million outstanding to deliver the ambition. But I think it's important that if delinkage is going to happen, then you have to have public investment. And I think it's also worth pointing out that all of the funding opportunities or approaches in AMR have not been fully funded. So when we can talk, we can talk about all of these things, but we also need to talk about sustainable funding, whether it comes to GARDP or anywhere else. The other thing that I just wanted to, to highlight is in relation to these programs, and this is kind of where we are at the moment, um, it's important to put into context. So for the neonatal sepsis, we've launched a global um, observational study to understand the prescribing practices in Africa, Asia, EU, and the US. That's not just for GARD-P. This should be made publicly available so that you understand the context in which you would seek to introduce any new treatments. Because if you don't understand how it's being used now and the type of approaches that doctors are using, then you're not going to be able to ensure proper stewardship and, and access. On pediatric antibiotics, we're also developing an international clinical trial network. I mean, the difficulty with, with pediatrics is obviously there are, there are ethical and other concerns about carrying out clinical trials. on. And then you would also try to take some information from this to help update the pediatric guidelines to, to support the work that is being done. Um, the, the last thing I really wanted to talk about is the memory recovery project which I think is an interesting approach to open knowledge. This was basically reaching out to people who've worked in the industry for them to bring forward old projects that they worked on and their knowledge. Um, and it's been a, a really interesting approach. There have been over 120 experts have registered and we've organized various webinars on how to carry out research and development. Uh, looked at uh, around 50 new chemical entities and starting to look at whether there could be some early stage discovery research into some of these combinations. So I think in summary, the, the, the reason that I've talked about what GARD-P is doing is to really to say at a very early stage, are there some lessons or approaches that we need to be looking at if you want to have public interest approach to R&D? First, it's very important that the public sector needs drive and set the agenda. And that's got to be based on identified needs and gaps. Uh, and the WHO has played a key role here. R&D strategies are important and TPPs are important to guide that approach. R&D is complex and requires a long-term approach and funding, but that funding has to be focused on the right stages and the right actors. You need to adopt an end-to-end -end approach. And access and stewardship can be factored in, 
by developers, but you need to involve a broader range of actors if this is to be really workable. There are certain things that product developers can do in their conditions, but you need to be, as Anthony's talking about, talking about the prescribers, you need to be talking about the context in which it's going to be introduced. And we don't feel that that is something that drug developers themselves should be working on. Um, and finally, if you want a public return on public investment, this can only be achieved by fair contractual partnerships to ensure registration, access, and appropriate use. Okay, thank thank you. You. Thanks, Michelle, for sharing the DNDI Guard P vision of a public health driven innovation framework, as well as how it's addressing the collective challenges in the R&D system and also meeting the goals of sustainable access, particularly through the example of the initial entasis, of course, um, a partnership uh, for, for against drug resistant gonorrhea. Um, it's interesting to contextualize, I would say, side by side a bit, of course, the um, widely bandied about perhaps overinflated $2.6 billion Hersace would take to bring a new drug to market against how much resources we have available for DNDI Guard P's work and ask ourselves, you know, are we really investing in the public sector in a strategic way um, that actually enables us to bring forward as you are projecting to do four new treatments by 2023, um, which are public health driven. We have a lot to do in stewarding our resources better. Um, Beyond bringing, of course, new drugs to market, um, we have to consider how do we manage existing ones. And I can't think of a better example for us to really learn from than the experiences, of course, that of, of assuring a sustainable supply chain and managing the stewardship of antimicrobials than through the work of the Global Drug Facility. And I'm so delighted that Brenda Wayne took the time. I know that, of course, with the UN, of course, deliberations just um, before um, this, we were just delighted that you were able to take the time and come and join us for this panel. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for, uh, for inviting me. It's actually great to be here. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Global Drug Facility, but it's a partnership that's based in um, Geneva. It's part of the Stop TB Partnership, and we're hosted by UN Ops, who are a UN entity. They're established in 2001, so that's before the Global Fund, with the specific purpose of pushing out poor quality, expensive, first-line TB medicines and replacing them with a market of quality-assured, affordable medicines. And that basically um, came about by creating the GDF. USAID and other donors gave grant money to GDF. That allowed countries to purchase from GDF. They could then attract suppliers. And they also always had a bundled service, so countries got technical assistance on procurement and supply chain management along with the drugs to, to build their capacity. So that was the basic model and the purpose. And it proved to be quite successful such that they then layered on a lot of different products. So second line medicines, pediatric medicines, diagnostics, and, and many other services. And now we basically really are a one-stop shop for all TB medicines, diagnostics, and, and products. And we're the biggest procurer of TB medicine di diagnostics for the public sector um, in the world. And it, it's evolved in terms of its products that it carries, but it's also evolved in terms of the types of activities it does under a stewardship role for the TB market. So um, the first strategic priority that we are now getting even much more involved in is market shaping and partner coordination. This is becoming um, an even more important uh, component of our work as the Global Fund and other donors are pushing countries to move towards domestic financing and domestic procurement. It's opening up a lot of policy um, issues that need to be addressed. Um, the second strategic area is strengthening country program uh, procurement and the global supply systems. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the third, which is, I think, really important, which maybe people don't necessarily know about, is the work to facilitate uptake of new tools. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So just a few quick results about GDF. Basically, there was no market for quality assured TB medicines before um, GDF was started. This is a diagram that, uh, that shows the, the growth of the second line TB market. Now, don't forget right now, it's still a, a flat demand curve. So we started at the beginning of this with, let's say, less than 30,000 people being treated. And now in the world, we still have less than 200,000 or so being treated. 
So we're talking very small volume numbers, but you can see that we've still been able to attract the number of suppliers. So we went from five in 2007 to 28 as of last year, and from eight quality assured products to 86. So a five and tenfold increase in suppliers and products. And with that, we've had about a 44% uh, reduction in, in, in price overall, some more than others. Um, in terms of um, our work to introduce new tools, that's a big focus of what we do now. We do a lot of work with suppliers while they're developing products, with the TB Alliance, with the private sector, with formulators, um, to try to show them that there will be a market once their products get there to minimize their risks, to uh, decrease their transaction costs and whatnot. And we've basically supported through what we call our launch pad Every new innovation that's come out, out of TB in the past, let's say, 17 years has been supported through uh, the Global Drug Facility. So Podacrylin, Delaminid, pediatric formulations, uh, gene expert uh, machines, um, and as of this year, we'll see for the first time in the history of the world, pediatric formulations for MDR, which are literally in their final stages of production now. The other thing we've been able to do is to figure out when you don't have volume uh, and when um, suppliers are literally producing medicines when they're ordered, how do you decrease lead times because country programs aren't so nimble. Um, and uh, when GDF started, basically lead times were more than six months for TB medicines. They um, basically established what they call a strategic rotating stockpile. They literally own inventory and it sits with their procurement agent and it allows them to float orders through the stockpile rather than placing them with the suppliers. And so this is what allows us to basically respond to emergency orders so countries don't run out of drugs. It allows us to um, launch new products. If you think about delaminid, we literally had orders for one and two patients at a time. If you don't have a stock, you can't put in an order to a company for one treatment. Right? So it allows us to do that sort of things. On the market shaping side, we've had a lot of recent um, policies that we've uh, fed, fed into. The WHO prequalification scheme recently announced annual maintenance fees, and we were able to work with them to show that for 84% uh, of our medicines, we just can't afford it. And that there was, I think it was more than half of our medicines, the fees, would be more than the profits. And so they were able to base, we were able to show them and convince them to waive the fees for 84% of our products. Many people don't know that the Global Fund uh, ERP system, which is something that allows uh, quality assurance as something goes through pre-call, was actually started by GDF as a means to quickly get quality assured medicines approved for TB. Um, we're doing a lot of work now to harmonize across the, the WHO EMP uh, essential medicines list, across the guidelines and whatnot. We've identified issues when it comes to product introduction that we've been able to get um, other organizations to react to. So one of the things we saw with pediatric medicines was countries wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't revert to the new medicines because they had old medicines and they wouldn't waste them. So we were able to work with the Global Fund to get a policy within the Global Fund that says you can waste them. And so now that's really important with these new regimens that we're now wanting countries to, to implement. We also saw that because WHO didn't have a specific mention in their guidelines about the importance of fixed dose combinations, that, um, that was preventing countries. So we got WHO Global TB program to put their stamp on a letter and, and these types of things. So basically figuring out, being that intermediary between the countries, what's holding them back, and the policy side and, and pushing to see what, what we can get done. We're doing a lot of work on diagnostics now. We're building up that area quite substantially. We're in a lot of negotiations with Cephid on um, improving the conditions of their service and maintenance contracts, which have not been so great on the pricing of that. We fed into um, uh, design work so that some of their new products coming out are more fit for purpose for the, for the audience that they're looking to serve. So some of the lessons we've learned um, in the TV space is that um, there's probably not 
um, a better example of a failed market than TB, especially the pediatric and MDR markets. And basically, um, the only way we've been able to, to really deliver these products and these services is by, by doing that market consolidation. So in these type of scenarios, you really do need a pooled procurement. You need to have some type of leverage in order to have this influence and up across the suppliers, across uh, policymakers and whatnot. Our strategic rotating stockpile has been really, really um, incredibly effective. We get a lot of requests from other diseases from malaria, can you please put ACTs in there? Um, because um, as countries, as I said before, now are switching to domestic financing and domestic procurement, their systems are not necessarily working quite well. They're having a lot of stockouts, and people are approaching us now to say, can you add other things to your stockpile? Um, we think that without coordination and uh, with the increased decentralization that we um, are seeing now in, in the financing space that we're really afraid that the quality shared market's gonna go away, that we'll see higher prices, um, and we're starting to see some of these things come through, which I'll show you. I think um, the other thing that we're worried about is that as the financing switches to domestic financing, what is, and it, it speaks to what Michelle says, what's the incentive then for companies to say, okay, I'll keep innovating? If the global fund money is now being pushed towards the countries and they don't see that anymore as the big scale up, how can we convince them that they should continue to come in, that there will be somebody there? In the past, we sort of had Unitaid, which would do the introduction uh, and catalyze the market, and then we had global fund as a scale up, and all of that is changing now. But we have a lot of things for the first time in the history of TB in the pipeline. And we want to make sure that if that mechanism is going away, that there's something else that moves in there to make sure that the innovation keeps going. Oops. So some of the observations that we've seen as countries move from donor funding to domestic funding um, we, because we are physically present in, in many countries, we have six regional advisors across the world. We have consultants, about 50 consultants, so we literally do a few missions a week. We have very good relationships with, with the national TV programs. Um, what happens is when they move away from donor financing to domestic financing is that all of those conditions that they operated under when they were getting donor money go away and they automatically revert to the procurement systems that existed before the donors came along. And what that means is that the experience to date across these countries really varies. So um, what we're seeing is that in a large majority of cases, countries are having a really hard time. There's no way that many countries can even put a tender and expect anybody to respond if they're only treating 5,000 people, right? It could be um, for other reasons that companies don't respond, but we're seeing failed tenders when, com when countries move away from donor financing or they maybe went through a big entity like a GDF or somebody else and they start buying on their own. We're also seeing a movement towards buying non-quality assured medicines and non-WHO recommended medicines and very high prices. Even for products that have concessional prices like Gene Expert, it's about $10 for a cartridge, we're seeing prices up to $70 because of all the middlemen that get involved when you revert to national systems. We're also seeing an alarming number of stockouts. And we basically have now added first line medicines to our stockpile. They had never been there in the past because we're seeing so many stockouts and of a very long quantity uh, uh, duration. I think um, this is a slide that basically shows you just how small the TB market is. And so on the left-hand side, this was the, this was the data that we gave to WHO pre-qualification program to convince them that they can't charge fees to our products. And what you can see there is that 61% of our medicines had annual sales of less than a million dollars. So um, we're talking about really, really, really small product markets. On the right-hand side, I just wanted to give you some comparison to, let's say, the generic market in low- and middle-income countries. So our market for TB medicines in 2016 was about 165 million for all of our medicines. 
And for the generic ARVs, same year, uh, is about 1.7 billion, right? And then if you compare that to, um, to the world market for ARVs, you're looking at about 20 billion. And we don't have that comparison in TV. We don't have the ability to leverage sales in high-income countries because TB is such a rare disease in these countries. So it's really a very difficult um, environment to be, to be working in, at, uh, which is the importance of having a, a stewardship role. I think, as Viviana had mentioned, um, unfortunately, TB has suffered from a lack of innovation. These medicines, rifampicin, isoniazide, fambutol, pyrazinamide, these are still the same medicines that we're using today for drug-sensitive TB. They were uh, developed between the 30s and the 60s. Um, and if you think about what was happening at that time, we're looking at the launch of Sputnik, the uh, premiere of American Bandstand. My parents watched American Bandstand, and I'm not 20 years old. So these are all drugs, yes? Only recently, as Viviana mentioned, we had two new innovations, podocalin and delaminate. Um, and those were the first new TB medicines that had been approved in over 40 or 50 years. So just uh, in conclusion, I just kind of want to say just very quickly what I think the strengths and limitations of uh, the GDF model are. I think one of the strengths is that it's been around for a long time. Uh, 17 years. It's been working in countries from day one, and it's not a donor model. So when you're a donor, you have to put a lot of preconditions on your money, reporting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we're really seen more as a partner. So donors give us money. We give grants to countries. We have to report to the donor, but they don't have that necessarily relationship with us. And that's been one that's allowed us to build up quite a bit of trust. I think we've also because we've had so much experience, been able to build different tools. I didn't explain all of them to you, but things like the stockpile that when countries really get into trouble and they have stockouts and you know uh, lives are literally um, in jeopardy, they can come to us uh, for, for a bailout. That's, that's one. I think the other thing is that because we work all the way from the, from the supplier end, all the way including policy to the demand end, we can literally take control of the entire supply chain. So right now, we have had a global shortage of first-line medicines for, I don't know, close to seven, eight months. But people don't really know. And that's because we've been able to take control of the supply chain and basically ration our orders across all the different countries. We have insight into what they have for stock or their enrollments. We know what they're ordering. We know when they really need it versus when they want it. And we can move things around. We are working at the very highest levels of the Chinese government uh, on environmental regulations that are affecting shutdown of factories that are um, making the active, ingredient, active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient unavailable, which is leading to the shortage. We're working with suppliers who can make API to make more API uh, on the generic end. So we're really able to take control of the entire uh, supply chain and advocate at a very high level. And that's another strength. So GDF, at, at my end, we have a lot of ability to influence, I would say, like the technical policy. But because we sit in the Stop TV partnership at the Luchica end, we also have the high level advocacy that you need when you need a political commitment or you need somebody to get to a minister or a minister of finance or the head of the global fund or something like that. And that's given us quite a bit of of pressure, as a lot of uh, leverage as well. Um, I think on the, the downside, you know, uh, we have one donor, and that makes it challenging because you have to uh, apply to that one donor's sort of agenda and, and rules and regulations. We haven't been able to date to really penetrate into the private sector, which we know is important in a lot of countries, and we're starting to explore that. We are a UN organization. That can be good, but that can also be a limitation. I don't think I need to explain why. Uh, but it, it can be quite bureaucratic and it can be quite limited. We, you know, now that we're with UN Ops, it's easier to find ways, ways to work, but that, that is a challenge. I think um, you know, opportunities to apply it to other ways in the way forward. You know, we have been approached by quite a few different organizations to say, could GDF expand into AMR? You have um, 
a lot of medicines that AMR cares about you use to treat TB, you're already dealing with them. Could you go into that space? We've been tap, uh, attracted by groups wanting us to add diabetes meds on because TB uh, and diabetes have a high comorbidity. Um, we've been, attract, we've been uh, approached by people wanting us to add asthma medications on. And so I think that it, it does, and it's something that we are considering now and we will um, be discussing internally, especially after the high level meeting from, from yesterday. Um, but I think it's, it, it's important to realize that um, the reason that GDF was so successful is because it worked for the most part under a donor environment. And so, you know, we had the ability of grants, we had the QA policies and the requirements and whatnot that allowed us to sort of create the market. And we now have to struggle with the same things that AMR needs to think about. If you're dealing with national systems and you want to have incentives for companies to make quality medicines and countries to buy quality medicines, that's a whole different ballgame. And we're starting to now work in that area because now that the financing is shifting, um, that's a requirement for us. Countries are moving towards domestic procurement. And so we are uh, committed to work with them, whether it's changing their regulations so they can act reasonably and buy through somebody else, or changing their regulations so they can continue to buy through us no matter which way they go, uh, we will be working. So going forward, we feel like this is the right time to come together across all of these initiatives, especially under the universal health care agenda, all the integration that people want to have happen, and, and it's definitely something that we will be um, in discussions about. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Brenda. And thanks for sharing with us really a fascinating portrait of how the Global Drug Facility has become a one-stop shop for enabling access to quality-assured TB commodities. I want to invite also our other speakers to come up to the, of course, to the podium while I, of course, finish up the summary here um, so we can get started on, hopefully, the uh, period of Q&A. Um, and, of course, the practical problem-solving approaches that you and your team have taken um, to address some of the challenges from, of course, the strategic rotating stockpile to the negotiated waiver of WHO prequalification pre fees. The reality, of course, of the shift to local procurement raises a lot of, of course, interesting challenges that we anticipate will be echoed as we consider, of course, how to make um, new antibiotics available for drug-resistant pathogens. So we're really appreciative of your coming to share that perspective here with us in those lessons. I'd like to open, and I'm not quite sure how much time we have, actually, uh, just a few minutes. We could just take a few, at least, questions, and the, the, I think the speakers will all be here, I believe, for, um, the, for some of the conference, and so I hope that you'll be able to take advantage of that time. Um, to, of course, to talk to them. Any questions that we could have from the floor? Esteban, maybe uh, you could say a few words on the licensing issue, because I know that was one issue we could barely fit in, obviously, on such a tight panel uh, lunchtime seminar. Um, is there a um, microphone someplace? That Yeah, it seems to be working now. Okay, no, um, so I mean, I think I don't have too much to, to add to what you already mentioned. I think uh, there's a lot of talk about putting money into, public money into the R&D for, for new antibiotics. And so the question becomes, if that's something that will happen in whatever mechanism, whether it's a pull or push or however, will that money come with any strings attached? I mean, I think it's only fair if there's going to be significant public investment that there are conditions for that kind of investment. So what are those kinds of conditions? What would be those strings that you put? Access certainly needs to come up uh, front and center. Access in low and middle income countries, um, not only, of course. And, and then concerns around uh, resistance, rational use, stewardship, etc. And so when you look at what's happening right now in the pipeline, as, as Michelle mentioned and, uh, and a few others, a lot of the actual development is happening in, through small biotechs. And often you have a clear problem of, of global reach. If those are the ones who are going to bring those drugs to market, how are they going to do that? Is it going to be just focusing on those 5, 6, 10, 20 uh, profitable markets? And what about access elsewhere? And so can you use a licensing model to bring in generic manufacturers? And as Michelle was saying, with, certain, with, with a clear set of conditions around quality, around uh, what kind of combinations would be allowed, about, around what, what marketing practice would be allowed, um, et cetera, et cetera. All these elements that can be part of a stewardship framework, but certainly are not the end of, they don't define the whole of what needs to be done in terms of stewardship, which a lot of things would need to be done 
nationally, uh, you know, in terms of the, the health systems, the regulatory, etc. So using licensing as, as a mechanism to support access and stewardship, but certainly not as the whole game. There needs to be a lot more, as, as, as people have mentioned. And I would commend, of course, uh, people to read uh, the uh, submission by the Medicines Patent Pool to the UNIACG, uh, which describes some of your, I guess, the, the approaches that you're thinking about for licensing. Now, one interesting, though, difference is that I don't know whether the Medicines Patent Pool has a contrast to or thoughts actually on the um, Scott Gottlieb proposal for licensing. Um, I'm just curious. It's used, obviously, for something quite different and not covered in your submission. So I'm curious if you folks have analyzed that. Uh, not, not really any detail, although I don't, I, I, what I'd like to understand better is, okay, that may work in the U.S. context. For hospitals will pay a fee to have access to that drug, regardless of, of, the, of the quantities that they would need, if I understand the proposal correctly. What about everybody else? What happens outside? So that, that's kind of one of the challenges. Is, um, some of these mechanisms can, can potentially, I don't, I don't know, be effective in a, in a given context, but we need to be thinking about uh, global access. How we, how we, if, the, if this drug is there and somebody needs it, how do we ensure that that person gets it? Uh, but at the same time, doesn't get used in first line when it's actually meant to be a, a drug that's meant to be used in reserve for those who really need it. And that's the challenging part. Thanks so much, Esther. Any questions from the floor on other aspects of the panel's presentations? Yes. I think we'll bring the we'll try bring the microphone back. Thanks so much, Stefan. Maybe um, uh, thank you very much. This is a very sincere question in the sense that I don't know anything about the topic, uh, and I'm very curious. Um, I've uh, often I think I've heard people uh, when when there's the concern about a small market for new antibiotics because uh, you don't want to use them, et cetera. Uh, people often just kind of say advanced market commitments. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering whether whether th there have been any any concrete plans by governments, uh, let's, let's say in high income countries, or maybe it doesn't matter, to actually formulate what advanced market commitments would look like. Um, and uh, whether there are some criteria uh, in, in what situations would they offer an advanced market commitment, how would they figure out what the size of the commitment is, et cetera. Are there any other questions? But we will probably have one round, I suspect. So I just want to make sure if there's anything else that's on the floor. Could we have then um, that question as well at the same time? And then I'll have the panel answer at once. Thanks. I just had a similar question. Um, so Brenda, you talked a lot about how the financing and funding of um, uh, neglected disease and TB uh, medicines is changing a lot. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on like how that field is changing. And like, are you also talking about those alternative financing mechanisms like the AMCs or other alternative financing mechanisms that like Gabby has put in place? So. And I think we'll have to take these two. Is there one more? Okay, so one more question, and then we'll have the panel. Um, Hi. Um, so, you, uh, Anthony, you talked about Civic RX. Um, Brenda, you talked about some of the problems with shortages um, of TB drugs right now. You know, beyond Civic RX, you know, that sort of proposal is a re response from hospitals that want to deal with shortages in the U.S. as well as um, provide some mechanism to protect against sharp price spikes on these older off-patent, uh, no-exclusivity drugs like the Shkreli scenario. Um, I'm wondering, do you think there's a role for something like that, a nonprofit or a, a, a public sort of production facility for some of these um, sort of staples of TB treatment that you're having problems with stockouts and shortages with? Okay, so we do have a few minutes actually to answer questions. So um, to 2.20 at the, at the outside, but why don't we just actually have um, perhaps the first um, three questions. If I think, I think maybe Michelle, you want to kick off or you want to start off, Brenda? Sure. So those are all great questions. Um, I think maybe start with the financing. The, the financing situation is such that for HIV, TB, and malaria, you know, it's been mostly global fund financing since 2002. I guess. Um, and most recently, the, the secretary and the board have been increasing requirements of the principal recipients with regards to co-financing. 
and um, it it's hit TB extra hard because it if they're having heavier requirements on um, middle income countries and TB is more of a middle income uh, disease than let's say HIV. So TB is kind of the in the coal mine in terms of really being first and foremost how, what that means for countries. So basically where they would have bought all of their medicines and diagnostics and provided all of the good majority of their services uh, for TB care with Global Fund money, the Global Fund is now saying, mm, sorry, it's time for you to co-finance and uh, every country is different, but they have increasing requirements over the next three years in terms of what they have to put on the table. So if you take the Eastern European region, which has very high rates of, of TB and MDR TB, just as an example, by 2020, uh, all but two countries have to be 100% self-sufficient with procurement of TB medicines and diagnostics. And that's a very quick move over, let's say, three to four years. And so this is having huge implications because as I said, as countries then start operating with domestic financing, they then revert from uh, buying through donor mechanisms to buying through national mechanisms and all of these challenges that we, we know have existed for a very long time, they're facing again with, with these products. So that's the change that we're, that we're seeing. Um, I think with Peter Sands here now at the Global Fund, he's been quite a early champion of TB and he's arguing for more money for TB and so maybe in the replenishment we might see see that I think typically TB gets the least amount of money from organizations like Global Fund and Unitaid maybe that will change now maybe the high level meeting will help I don't know but the reality is right now uh, the funds that the countries are really being asked to step up to the to the table I think in terms of, um, you know, uh, whenever there's a, a challenge in getting somebody to create a, a, a formulation or develop a new product or whatever, I think the knee-jerk reaction is, well, we need an advanced market commitment or we need a volume guarantee or we need a buy-down as we did with Gene Expert. I think that um, I really like this idea that uh, that Michelle had had put up here, this guard P, because I think it's a it's a it's a much better thought out strategic approach than just kind of you know give them the money up front or tell them it's there and they will come. Because I think the reality is is that the experience with AMCs have not been great. I think for Gene Expert. Um, you know, there was a buy-down that happened uh, when the product was launched, a revolutionary product that allows you to diagnose TB in 90 minutes as opposed to, you know, weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, it had a really perverse impact on the field. And now that company wants a buy for every new thing they add. And all the other diagnosers are saying, where's my buy-down? For volume guarantees, we have been approached, when I was at Unitaid, we were approached by some very clever organizations to give volume guarantees for TB medicines that there was only one supplier. And we didn't think that was the right way to go, and we did not give it. And right now, we have more than we need. And we will have lost a lot of money by giving those volume guarantees. So I think you have to be quite clever when you utilize those instruments, and I think Gavi has been quite clever, but I think this model that is, I hope that, the, I hope that the move shifts away from that towards this. Quite frankly, I think it's the consulting firms that don't work in this space, and they come in and they get asked to do a consultancy in Global Fund or whatever, and this, this is what they know. Oh, AMC, volume guarantee, that's what you should do. And I think that's literally what happens. And then the board says, oh, I understand that, let's do that. Michelle, do you want to add anything to this? Um, I think it's worth distinguishing between what, in, what an incentive is to generate innovation and an incentive that is needed to keep an existing player in the market. And I think that um, AMCs, um, particularly if we're talking about the Gavi model for pneumococcal, 
did not actually incentivize new innovation. And it turned out to be a very expensive way of giving a, an advanced purchase commitment. Um, I do think, and, and perhaps this is unfortunate, in that, and thank you for what you said about Guard P, but I do think that we w are also going to be looking at what can you do to, co to keep a number of suppliers in the market. And I think this is what I was trying to, to, to allude to when we're talking about thinking about the incentives and who they need to go to. Because at the moment, there is, and I think it is a bit of market consultants, big ideas. We need to have these big ideas, and they need to be directed at big pharma. We need to be talking about massive amounts of money. But if you look at where the problems are, there are certain inflection points that we can already see. And I think your, um, your presentation was excellent in really helping to highlight that in terms of if we've got a small player that comes in and we've got you need to conserve and you want to keep people continuing to supply after the innovation has been created and that can be funded in different ways through a guard p model or others what is it that we need to do there and i think maybe then we we could be thinking about some kind of pool demand um and and maybe some kind of other financial incentive. But I think we need to continue to have those discussions with you and with Unitaid and others about whether that, how that can work. Because I do see that as an issue in terms of once you have a product, um, how can you keep people interested in the market? I guess it's on the last question. The last question, I think it's something worth exploring. So I think it's something, at least in the IECG, it's, it's in there in the agenda to look at if there could be a recommendation. Um, but a lot has to be built on this. There isn't any, um, I haven't seen too much work being done to really seriously consider where could you have more um, manufacturing capacity that's then pooled together and that it's financed uh, globally. Um, for shortages, definitely that should be an area for, for stockouts, but uh, I haven't seen uh, any agencies really seriously looking at it yet. So it's very interesting. Civica Rx has announced that they will look at 14 generic drugs for which there are, uh, we are experiencing shortages, particularly in the United States, um, as their initial starting point. They won't name yet which of those drugs are. I suspect there are a lot of uh, strategic reasons for actually uh, being coy a bit about which particular drugs they're focusing on as, as their initial entry points. But um, I think there's a lot to watch in this space um, because it does suggest actually a very different um, engine um, potentially within the pharmaceutical R&D landscape. Because if in fact we have literally healthcare delivery systems saying we cannot actually afford um, certain medicines, we need to take greater control of, of the supply chain. And then having them literally vertically integrating upstream, now that is actually quite novel. Um, and actually when we first, first caught wind of this, we were quite excited because in many ways, we've been talking for a number of years about where, in fact, would be the next step for um, the public, a publicly owned, or even in this case, it's actually privately owned, but it's actually a, a part of the healthcare delivery system that's different than, of course, where we traditionally have focused our efforts, which really was the divide between a heterogeneous pharmaceutical industry that had big pharma and then had a number of, um, of course, biotech uh, firms and small and medium-sized firms to supply the space. This really could be a game changer if they actually have a, str a strategic plan that's anchored in a guaranteed demand market, like the 10 healthcare delivery systems that have actually committed already uh, to this. This is not a minor effort, I think. It'll be very interesting to see, and I'd be very curious if they should go to like the Second World Conference on access to medical products in a few weeks, if they actually were to connect with Indian, uh, for example, generic suppliers of API um, um, ingredients, what could come of this um, down the road? So I think there's some very interesting, perhaps, chemistry I'm yet to come out of some of these efforts. So we'll have to watch the space. Other questions? Sorry. Just, um, I think it, it's a very interesting example. It's a very US example. Um, I think it's worth looking in other countries. For example, in Brazil, they have public production, which is supposed to be connected to their national health system. Um, and there are challenges there in terms of whether the, the government will still support uh, an approach and whether it would be sufficient 
for the public production to continue if they just focused on shortages and the producer of last resort. So um, I think that it's, it's interesting because it brings financing and it connects the two. Um, but I think we also need to look at um, other models in, in other countries to see whether it is possible to replicate or whether it is something that is um, peculiar to, to, the, to the US circumstance. But it's, it is very interesting, but I think we also need to look at some of the challenges that we've seen in Brazil and elsewhere in, in taking this approach. It would be interesting contrast, I guess, to also, again, the state-owned um, parastatals um, working in this space as well. Um, we have a lot more work, I think, to do to look at that, both in places like Thailand and uh, Brazil. But again, most of these have been on the distal end of the supply, of the supply chain of the R&D part. But it's interesting to see, again, some more movement in this space. Um, any, um, any other comments? Any other questions? But with that, I wanted to thank really our speakers for really a remarkable set of perspectives. I think you know each of them have brought really, I think, a, a new um, layer of complexity to the challenges that we are, of course, been encountering um, in various actually policy for over the particular antibiotic innovation and what do we go, how do we go forward um, from, of course, the anchoring of the of these perspectives in, the, in where the disease burden is greatest, where Viviana really spoke to some of the concerns of low and middle income countries. To of course the efforts underway at um, the NDI and Guard P in bringing forward a new innovation model. In many ways, of course, um, the the logical follow-on from actually over a decade of work uh, that we've seen in the neglected disease space. And of course, to Brenda, who was able to share with us some of the important lessons that we should capture in going forward through the global drug facility as we look forward, of course, to trying to bring forward um, drugs for. Um, uh, for multi-drug resistant pathogens. Um, so thank you so much for participating. We just also would like to also mention, of course, tomorrow, the Global Development Stewardship Framework actually consultation. Um, Virginia, where will this be held, do you know? Um, yes, it's going to be in uh, room Y403, not sure which one that is, but we'll hopefully send out the information. It's so, on the agenda. So it will be from 8 to 9.30. Um, breakfast is served. We hope that folks will join us as WHO, FAO, and OIE present um, the draft framework ahead of the member state consultation next week on, on October 1st and 2nd in Geneva. Thank you so much and uh, appreciate, again, our speakers for all their efforts to, to actually come and share their perspectives. It's Y403. I just don't know where. I know this is the name of the room, just not where in the building it is. No, sorry. They made it not available. Yeah, I can ask if they do have that, but I'm, they might have just canceled the whole thing. They have to do something like record it, but make the link unavailable, so I don't know what that means. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I'll 
to see how what the best way to get there. Yeah. Well, I can cut it to when you actually start your presentation. Yeah. 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 Oh, really? Oh, no. I recommended 